Welcome to Back to the Frame Rate, part of the Western Media Podcast Network. Back to the Frame Rate, where we watch and discuss films on VOD and streaming platforms for your entertainment. I am Nathan Shore, and I'm here with Brianna Butterworth and Sam Cole. Hey, hey, hey. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Sam. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's Christmas. Holiday it's- season, people. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah, it is the three of us today. Ellie is off traveling. She's with family and doing all mm-hmm. her holiday stuff this week. So, hey, Ellie, hope you're enjoying your your we time miss with your you, family. Ellie. Hi, Ellie. It's me, <laughs> Sam. I'm Sam Cole. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, this is a uh, this will be fun. We are wrapping up our our fourth uh, episode of our subversive holiday films on the show this week with the 1984 Joe Dante film Gremlins. So um, I don't know if we should, uh, let's not linger too long, but first of all, you know, it is, it is, today is, uh, we're releasing this on Christmas day. So I guess uh, Merry Christmas and happy holidays to everybody out there. And I hope you're enjoying the holiday season, but uh, let's get into uh, this episode. And I guess we'll start with, well, what should I start with? I guess what I what I usually do. You want to start with the trailer? I'm gonna give him a trailer. Yeah. Want to give him the trailer? I guess I'll give him the trailer. Here we <laughs> are. Billy Pelser has a nice home. Billy, is that you? Yeah, Ma, it's me. A nice job. A nice girl. If you're not doing anything this Thursday night, maybe you'd like to uh, go out on a date with me. I'd love to. And loving parents. Who are about to give him? You're gonna like this. No, no, no! Don't shake it. We're gonna have to open it now. Won't wait till Christmas. The most unusual gift (laughs) he ever got. What is it? It's your new pet. Come on, Barney, be a good dog. My dad gave it to me. But there are a few things to keep in mind. If you expose it to the light, you may hurt it. If you get it wet, it will multiply. All that from water? They got wet? No, plain water. And most important, no matter how much they beg, never, never let them eat after midnight. Because when they do, they change. They become clever, mischievous. All right. I'm gonna cut it off there because I've had enough. Oh, but um, it was going so well. <laughs> um, you know what? I for some reason, I you know I grew up during this time, and I remember this being a better trailer at the time. I don't know. I, this gives away so much of the sto- of the movie, and I nice. just it doesn't doesn't sell me <laughs> for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, anyways. That's the trailer for that's the official trailer that I found oh, on on um on Grumpy. There's some there's some more modern trailers that I think they do a much better job kind of hiding plot details if you've never seen this movie. But mm. anyways. So Sam, do you have some movie facts for us? Indeed I do. Uh so I will discuss those movie facts. Uh <laughs> First, I would like to mention that my proper podcast microphone had some issues tonight, so I'm using regular computer audio. So to the legion of listeners out there, my apologies, and I hope I will do better for all 200,000 of you. Um, anyway, so yes, Gremlins, uh, this film came out in 1984, it is directed by the amazing Joe Dante and uh, executive produced by Steven Spielberg. Um, this film was actually written by Chris Columbus, uh, who many of you know from Harry Potter fame and uh, his inspiration, which I've always found fascinating and cool. Um, this is actually uh, from Wikipedia and says, as Columbus explained, his inspiration came from his loft when at night what sounded like a platoon of mice would come out and to hear them skittering around in the blackness was really creepy. So he wrote. Uh, an original screenplay, which Spielberg took an interest in because he found it so original. Then he produced that. Uh, This movie actually, interestingly enough, opened on June 8th, 1984, the same day as Ghostbusters. That's insane. Uh, Terrible plan. just amazing. Yeah. And uh, both films did like incredibly well that weekend. And uh, but you would you would think that this would just completely cannibalize each other. These these two movies. Oh yeah, and it's crazy. 
the supernatural elements and same target audience. You would yeah, imagine. I'm thinking about like Barbie and Oppenheimer were at least sort of counter programming, counter pro, you know, I, I guess just can't Kremlin believe Buster. like what it would be, what it would have been like to have been like part of a 1984 audience that has that choice. As an, as two right. movies on the weekend, my like head would explode. I'd Keep be like, in this mind. is great. You have to go yeah. on a cheap Tuesday. You know? And I know, I know you've got more movie facts, but remember back then, movies were in theaters for months as well. Yes. And, I, and you know that back then, the opening weekend it didn't hold as much water as it does now. Right now, you've got like an opening weekend and maybe two, three weekends after that where it is critical that you get like 90% of your box office receipts. Oh, yeah. And back then, if these came out on June 8th, you had the entire summer, you know, to that they imagined they were going to make bank on. So it was a different time. It, it I guess was, what's yeah. – oh, sorry, Sam. But what's so weird about this to me is this is so not a summer movie. <laughs> It's not a summer movie, but the director Joe Dante, and this is actually in like some making, uh, some making of footage. He's talking to the child actor, the kid from the store at the beginning of the film. Mm. He's talking to him about the movie, and so the kid says to him, "He's like, so it's kind of come out at Christmas, right?" And Joe Dante's rationale for it not coming out at Christmas, he said, since it's a Christmas movie, if it comes out at Christmas. By January, people will not be interested in it because Christmas oh. is over. So he's like, so we'll release it in the summer and then Christmas can play and play and play. And so that was I that's, wonder, that's, uh, his uh, I, decision I, I, there. It took a long time for movies to come to home video back in the 80s. But I'm, yeah. So I'm guessing that this was not something people could even buy on VHS mm-hmm. back in 1984 for the Christmas season. But Because I'm, I'm assuming maybe mm-hmm. by... December, it might have gotten on HBO or something, possibly, but maybe not. I don't, I don't know. I wonder what the there because the windows were different back then for for these things. I, I am curious because I'm guessing by the fall, this was still in like second run theaters, and wow. you know, probably through the fall and into the winter, it probably was still playing in some theaters. I would not be surprised. It was. I remember like at, even in the late 80s when I was still pretty young, uh, there was like five, six months between theatrical release and uh, VHS release, you know, depending on the success of the film. But like a movie mm-hmm. I would see in the summer of like 1989 around mm-hmm. Thanksgiving of 89, I'd see, see like posters for those films well, in the actually, video store. Well, actually, mm-hmm. I don't mean to interrupt you. The smartest thing was releasing this in the summer and the merchandising – Mm. That Christmas season. How many people yeah. wanted their Gizmo doll and Gizmo merchandise for it, for Christmas? That brilliant. Is, yes, that is really. And we'll tie into that later in the show, but that's obviously what they were thinking. Gizmo was like the Gragu mm. Baby Yoda of his day. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 he's like the original. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Sam. Continue. I didn't mean to cut you off on all that. No, no worries. Um, and so, yeah, so it came out June 8th. And uh, by the end of its American screenings in, on uh, November 29th, it actually had grossed over $148 million domestically, uh, which, and, you know, and that's a $1984. So it was the fourth highest grossing <laughs> film of the year. Um, I really love the cast starring uh, Zach Galligan as Billy Peltzer, Phoebe Cates as Katie Berenger. Hoyt Axton as Randall Rand Peltzer, Polly Holiday as Ruby Deagle, Francis Lee McCain as Lynn Peltzer, Corey Feldman as Pete Fontaine, and Key Luke as Mr. Wing, the shop owner. And um, uh, one of my favorites uh, is also Dick Miller plays the oh, fun yeah, Mr. God, there's so much more. Dick Miller, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's great in this. Yeah. But most importantly, Howie Mandel voices Gizmo. Yeah, and True Frank, Frank Welker. Uh, yes. really, really well-known yes. voice actor does Stripe, and you know he's mm-hmm. been everywhere for decades and decades, yeah. lending his voice talents to uh, a lot of uh, a lot of projects. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, great, amazing cast in this, really. Yeah, it's awesome. And I read that Phoebe um, wasn't there wasn't their first choice after Fast Times at Richmond High. They weren't going to go with her. They think she was right for the role, and she crushed it. She did awesome. I think it was. I'm glad uh, she. I'm glad they picked her. She was like perfect in it. Yeah. Mm. Was there any information about the casting of Zach Galligan? Because he was obviously a very unknown actor. I I don't know if I've ever seen him in anything else. Mm. 
No, I just, I, all I know, and it's like not even the most like informative <laughs> story, but he was getting out of college to go to spring break in Florida and he'd just gotten uh, to like the hotel there. And then he got a missed phone call from the front desk and he called back and the front desk said it was his mom to say that he'd gotten the part in Gremlins. And so they needed to do costume fittings with him right away. So he immediately turned around and went back to the airport because oh, he had to start Bum. the next day. So he like showed up at the beach, got the phone call and left. And like, oh. I can't imagine that, uh, the excitement of that experience. That's the only um, thing that's better than spring break. Like if something's going to take me away from spring break, it's a Joe Dante and Steven Spielberg movie. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I didn't, I know he did some TV stuff, some minor TV stuff before this, but I think this was kind of the big, big thing. Yeah. 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 <coughs> Excuse me. So, all right. Um, anything else, Sam, or is that it? That is what I got at the moment. If, uh, if you guys have any other thoughts, but, uh, yeah, I mean, Great film. Yeah, lots of technical problems with the uh, gremlins on the set. A uh, really mm -hmm. brief story. Uh, Spielberg and several executives showed up, I think, to like, you know, show the busy set and how everything was going. And he happened upon them when all the like crew working the gremlins were asleep because they were recharging and stuff like that. So they walk in like all the gremlins are inactive. All the crew is asleep and like Spielberg and like real exciting movie here. Come in the door. He's, like, he's like, oh. Yeah, but um, <laughs> uh, so that was a very entertaining story. But yeah, lots of technical difficulties. Really, like, and we'll the puppets fell apart. The oh God, fell yeah, apart. puppet yeah. fell apart. Like, lots of uh, obstacles in this film. Mm, yeah. They got it done. They got it done. All right. And uh, what I note that it was composed by Jerry Goldsmith, who was you know has a laundry mm -hmm. list of credits um, from Patton, Planet mm -hmm. of the Apes, The Omen, did Alien which I mm -hmm. love that score and uh, the original first Star Trek movie, Poltergeist and Secret of Nim. Many, a lot LA of Confidential. He's yes, incredible. So yeah. 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 So, so incredible. many. Yeah. So, uh, um, yeah. So why don't we uh, just give our brief thoughts, each of us on our, our thoughts on this film and uh, in, a, in our star rating. So Sam, why don't I start with you? So I uh, truly love this movie because I like grew up with it as a kid and like my like father introduced it to me on VHS and mm -hmm. the concept for me, even when I first saw this movie as a seven year old, for me, it was always like fun, scary, <laughs> not scary, yeah. scary. I was never like terrified. I was just truly enjoying the almost like anarchic glee of the film and um, I, uh, it's, it's, it's funny. It's difficult to, to discuss it because I've seen it so many times. It's like, um, but, um, so my review of the film is really positive and I love that it starts off in the tone of kind of like, it's got a very ET cute vibe, like Gizmo shows mm -hmm. up and it's, it's, everything's very sweet. And then all of a sudden the movie goes completely like horror, horror bonkers, wacky yeah. fun. Always love this film, the build up the scenes, uh, Dick Miller's performance, as the American, he's like, who just is like blames all machinery on like foreign parts being an issue, like yeah. such a stereotypical, like he, his character, he's in several Joe Dante films and like he was just amazing. Um, I love the uh, once everything goes crazy. I love the climax. I just like the structure to the movie. I um, it's 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 hard to to almost focus because I just I've known the movie for so long have so much praise for it. but I would say in a nutshell to sum up I love the film um, I think it's great I think it works I there are several other Joe Dante films that I like a lot um, including Gremlins 2 which is a wacky <laughs> insane sequel that Stop I can't trying believe to get me to watch Gremlins 2 I can't these I'm two not have gonna not, do it <laughs> people people of earth these Under two have direct. not seen Gremlins 2 these have these two people have not seen Gremlins oh 2 God. and it is a it is a it will, you know what? I I don't blame them. I have patience, but we'll be able to correct that in time. When we I'm gonna watch cut your film. mic again. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's there's my mic is gone. Uh, but um, but yeah. So in a nutshell, I would say I would give the film, I would give it four and a half stars for me personally. Damn. Uh, just because I have I have so much of a history in like, of. Uh, I saw it when I was really a little kid and I saw it over the years and like all the memories are kind of in, intertwined. Mm -hmm. So it's almost impossible for me to be biased because I'm, I'm like too close to the material just because I've seen it so many times. <laughs> right. um, but yeah, 
without going and we can, we'll, we'll like go into detail in a moment, but like without going into scene details, just like mm. my brief opinion that I just overwhelming love the humor, love Joe Dante's cynical, twisted, yes. like aware of corporate dark side mm -hmm. uh, that he has in a lot of his films. And it's really cynical. And it's like, there's a hint of like, mean spiritedness, but it's done with such craftsmanship that it amuses the hell out of me. I love the dark. I love it's the like, like George Carlin-y. Yes. George Carlin I love the humor. like Jekyll and Heidi vibe of this movie. Yeah. It's like all cutesy. And then like, I like the like jabs at ET and just the, just the tone of it. So yeah, positive review, four and a half stars rambling on forever. My apologies. Okay. B. I can't follow that. I don't know. What do you want me to say? It's a good movie. <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. I didn't grow up with Gremlins. So yeah. I'm in that weird liminal space where Gremlins like came out kind of close to when I was born. It was like five or six years before I was born. So at that point, it wasn't like the cult classic. It's everywhere that it is. Now. I think at least it didn't seem that way as a kid. It didn't seem ubiquitous like it does now. Um, there was other stuff coming out. There were the home alones that were coming out when I was young, that kind of stuff. So it wasn't a Christmas classic for me, but at the same time, there's nothing I don't like about this movie. If you put it on, I'm having like a good time. I love B horror movies. And I love that this rides the line of like, it's not a spoof. It's not a spoof. Like a lot of stuff that came out in the eighties, it doesn't feel like it's making fun of horror. It's not a horror spoof. I should say it doesn't feel like it's making right. fun of horror yeah. movies. It's just, got scary stuff in it and it's not a horror movie it's just funny and i i really love that energy and i think that's so embedded in some of my favorite 80s b horror movies so in that way i think it sort of like falls into the pantheon of like other 80s b horror that i really love but for me it's not the like classic it was on tv all the time watch it all the time i've seen this movie like maybe three or four times you bring up a really good point too about um, how uh, you were saying that um, like you like the sort of original tone of the film. And like, that's mm -hmm. one thing that I like about it because it's so its own thing, like mm -hmm. it's committed to its own vision. And so the gremlins are like a unique thing and it's not like, Oh, we're spoofing this. Like they may mimic things in their behavior, mm -hmm. but they themselves like the creepy creation yeah. is taken seriously and like when they hatch i find it really really spooky and like really effective unnerving yeah mm -hmm. yeah um, really effective yeah 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 okay. it it felt kind of alieny with all it's a wet movie and it lot does of it's it's got that wetness and i um i i i also like the not Fairy tale is definitely the wrong word, but like the no, it's like it's fantastical. Like a, it's like fantastical, magical. magical, and like it ends yeah. on that note when like when Gizmos Deliver, it's just like the last shot of voiceover, and he's walking yeah. out into the street. It's got this like mystical. That's very Spielbergy, though, right? It's like Spielberg. that, like it's very that, like, like lofty kind of that lofty like kind of cool epic feeling, and I love it. And yeah. it somehow manages to tug at the heartstrings just like a little bit. It's like holiday warmth ish but not in yeah. like a not in like an overly sentimental like sweetie yeah like, it's like a holiday boy, scented yeah. candle but no one actually made cookies <laughs> exactly you know? yeah like exactly in, in all you get is like the you get the aroma and the flavor yeah. and you're like you're like hey that's uh, that's uh, that's pretty that's good that's pretty good that is good no. bob I, De Niro, yeah, that is good. good movie that i always good. thought i always thought this is like what if what if Norman Rockwell, but twisted, you know? Oh, interesting. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, yeah. you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to um, toot my own horn, but you know, the movie that I made and I kind of mentioned last week is the whole point <laughs> of this, like, you know, Spielberg made this movie, this family friendly movie, but honestly it's not Spielberg, but Joe Dante, but it's, it's really twisted, but it didn't go far enough. Well, Dante you know? wanted it darker. <laughs> yeah. I was I was reading some interviews. He wanted it really dark. I mean, there was some yeah. decapitation. The original dog script. died. The original and, script. And, yeah. And Gizmo transformed the original script too. And, and then it, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. In, the, in the original script, the mother got beheaded and like yeah, uh, decapitation. Pelter, like he come, the kid comes home and like her head's like rolling down the stairs. How messed up that's, psycho would that that's be? That's a like, Peter like, Jackson movie. That's, that's a Peter yes. Jackson movie. Yeah. Yes. 
but it Spielberg came in and was like, the people, they're going to want to see the Gizmo. And he was right, because I do. Probably made an extra $200 million because of that and sold you know? millions yeah. in merchandise yeah. <laughs> because of that. Spielberg so. just knew he was like, he could see the audience responding so well to Gizmo. And he's like, yeah. we can't lose this character in the first third yeah. of the movie. Like, he must survive. And they like rewrote it. And then it's like, totally, I'm like, I totally get it. And like, it's fine, because it still works, you know? And now Howie Mandel does game shows. That's how I know him. When I heard he was the voice of Gizmo, I was like, the game show guy? That's crazy. What? Is he a magician or something? I don't and know. And the movie Walk Like a Man. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> that sounds like an Amanda Bynes movie. I don't know anything. <laughs> when the family at the end, like the father, like when the, we're watching like Gizmo and, and the like shop owner walk away, but it's the family mm-hmm. standing outside and it's like the mother and the father mm-hmm. and, and the son and his girlfriend, the way they're just like lined up, like in a, it's like a postcard shot. It's such a Spielberg, like oh, yeah. tug at the heartstrings. It's also like generational. It's like, here's the parents. And then here is the next generation that will follow mm-hmm. them. Like, it's kind of it just hits it on the nose a little bit, but it it uh, just it works. It's like so I'm yeah. aware of what it's doing, but the, it's just it's I'm like, but I'm buying it. You know, like I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's B, what's 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 your, what's your rating yeah. for this? I don't know. <laughs> I'm, putting, I'm putting your feet to the fire. Oh man, I don't know. I guess like three and a half, okay. four, four, four. It's four star movie. Four okay, star. four stars. Yeah. Okay. There's like nothing I don't like about it, you know. Right. We, by the way, I will make it official now, and so I will like uh, uh, commit these guys to it, even if they don't want to. But in the future, at an undisclosed time, <laughs> we will be reviewing Gremlins too. I you, need you to gotta, be. That's, so that's going to be a great conversation. That. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be a conversation <laughs> and a half, not to be confused with <laughs> Naked Gun two and a half, a funny movie. <laughs> I love the Naked Gun movies. Yeah, mm-hmm. they're great. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Nathan, what did you think of Gremlins? So I, I guess, you know, like many people of mm, similar vintage, I'll, I'll say, <laughs> you know, I, you know, I grew up with this film. I was nine, 10, maybe when this in the summer of 84, yeah. I'm telling you, I, you know, I don't know if there was a better time between the ages of nine and 11, between the years of 83 and 85, when it came to movies, mm-hmm. uh, there were, I think just made for us back then, I feel. And I I saw this a couple of times in the theater. I remember my parents took me twice to see this. At least I probably saw this with other friends, parents. I, this, I probably saw this more times than any movie, this and short circuit. I saw at least four or five times in a theater. I don't, that's that's a little known fact. Yeah. But did you Um, see Ghostbusters? I saw Ghostbusters in the theater. I don't, I think only one time because Ghostbusters legitimately scared me. Mm. Yeah. You know why? It was the li- the the ghost in the library in the beginning of the movie scared the hell out. That of me. is that is scary. Yeah. It, like it still is. Yeah, yeah. cuz it's well done and there's something creepy about it. Yeah. I agree. It's like it's comedy but scary. Yeah. <laughs> well, libraries, you know, yeah, don't know. Watch movies. So, um so this movie back then as you know, 9, 10-year-old Nathan, this was my jam completely. And I re- revisit this maybe every seven, eight, nine years or so in my life. Um, but as of right now, so we're talking right now, what I think about this. And I watched this mm-hmm. for the podcast last week. And it's the first time I probably watch this with a critical eye, mm-hmm. wearing my review hat. Uh, which idea. I've never done before. It's weird. A movie I've seen. This, the, of all the movies we've watched on this podcast, this is the one I've probably seen the most. Probably well over 20, 20 times in my life. Um, and I, you know, and I can say on an entertainment level, this movie, I'll call the Spielbergian gold. It's, Mm -hmm. it is on the Mount Rushmore of classic eighties films. No doubt. It's, it's a Mm -hmm. perfect blend of horror comedy and adventure. I think we should mention as well. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, it's perfectly situated in, like I said, the Steven Spielberg wheelhouse. And And I think what's interesting is, you know, we're, I bring Spielberg up a lot because this feels like his fingerprints are all over this. And I think for 100%. years, um, like a lot of people probably thought this was a Steven Spielberg pre- uh, directed movie. The first thing you see is Steven Spielberg presents. I yeah. probably went well into the nineties. The Amblin logo. That, yeah. that exactly. Dante directed this. So I'm yeah. thinking like, Oh yeah, St- Spielberg directed this. Cause in yeah. all the references to, 
to all of his films, E.T. Mm-hmm. And of course, on the movie marquee, you even see um, the working titles of his movies, like A Boy's Life, which you have was- Wonder in the <laughs> Skies, yeah. You know, all, yeah. All, uh, all these movies, which are working titles for his movies, like Close Encounters of the Third Kind and E.T. You know, it's like, I mean, of course, it's, it's, it's Spielberg to, to the T. So, but, you know, watching this now- um, when you know, I'm really thinking about the underlying themes of this movie, mm-hmm. and um, when you know, really thought about this, I, I really you know started to notice all like things like the consequences of consumerism and mm-hmm. like the Amer- American capitalism, xenophobia, fear of foreign mm-hmm. imports. I never really thought about this stuff beforehand, yeah. and I think it's just a very, really great satirical indictment on mm-hmm. these topics that I just think are brilliantly crafted. Yeah, the um, father's inventions that consistently fail, I think, are a great – like, they can be read as funny, but they're also a great commentary. And then he has to is, go buy this gift that also kind of fails. It's, yeah, it's really it's so sad for the family is held hostage by this, these dads – his dad's inventions. They, they walk into the kitchen, <laughs> and they look, they look over at the orange juice maker like, oh, crap, it's, this morning is not going to go well oh because God. they just know that they are – that what they have to deal with. And the thing just explodes. I'm like, I would just move. It feels easier to move. <laughs> than to clean up but that they mess. feel bad for him as well you know so yeah. um I, so anyways um i don't know i guess maybe i'll just leave it at that because i think once but the thing is once you begin to dissect this film the rules the character motivations i do think you begin to see the cracks in the infrastructure mm-hmm. of this film and I'll get have you that. considered that that's not important i know i <laughs> yet again i will point to Grem- gremlins 2 that hilariously <laughs> acknowledges this point there's a whole conversation in that movie about but what about different time zones this is ridiculous guys like gremlins <sighs> 2 I'm telling you. Mm. Yeah. We'll get into it in a bit. You know, and, yeah. and it's again, it's a topic that's been discussed for almost 40 yeah. years. So we don't have to actually, but you to know. your point, I don't know, and this is just to to the class. Do we collectively feel like we need our characters to have like very clear motivations all the time? Do we need that spelled out for us? Um, I would say no. that the most all important the thing, if you make an emotional connection with a character in a movie, then mm-hmm. they're mo- like, you know. If if you think about it, like I agree, like the the depth mm-hmm. of the quote unquote like science behind the plot is th- quite thin because it's like a sure. like a fairy tale thing, and like I I do I do see the cracks. I do think there's also like I love the movie, but if if we were speaking critically, I I feel uh, there's a little like plant and payoffs um, mm-hmm. missing in certain areas. Like uh, Judge Reinhold has this like. I'm a jerk scene. And then he like never comes back. Not mm. that he's a particularly important character. He was in another, some scenes that ne- that were cut. Yeah. That were cut. Yeah. And maybe they were cut for a good reason, but um, so but I, I hear what you're important saying. To yeah. me. Cause yeah, I think, it, oh, I yeah. think, I think of this movie, like I think of the princess bride, like that kind of level yeah. of like fantasy. Type. Yeah. 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 I know yeah. archetypes. Okay, I know. There are everyone's an archetype. For yeah. Me, it, yeah. For me, it works in like what really, I think but what I love point. about the movie is the like the eerie Christmas setting. Like when they first hatch in the mother's house and she's like alone and like fends them off like a total badass. It's just that yeah. scene is so it's it's funny. We're gonna get like, there, Sam. But it's like it's terrifying <laughs> too. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's action packed. But yeah. But um, I, I think I've, I've stayed in my piece in this. You know, but you know, g- bottom line is this was '80s family mm-hmm. entertainment. And for what it's worth, I think it's a, an amazing spectacle and it, it's a hell of a lot of fun. So I, if I look at it at that surface level, I think it's a really fun film. I, I'm giving it four stars. Uh, not, yeah, four stars. I'm happy with that because I, I still think that it's, uh, I do have some, I think it could have been better with, with, you know, with a little more consistency with. By the end, I have so. real, I get it, vibes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but all right. So let, let's just talk about the, the the plot a little bit, all right? And let me pull that up here. So, so the beginning of this, he's mm-hmm. buying the gift. He's in the shop mm-hmm. with the three rules. We got Mister Wing. We got this, mm-hmm. his his grandson and Mister Pel- Peltzer, right? Mm-hmm. All right. 
By um, the way, a quick shout out to the DP, um, John Hora, who he also was a DP for Honey, I Blow Up the Kid mm -hmm. and Starship Troopers. His, uh, the whole Chinatown set was like the back lot of Burbank. The lighting job, like the atmosphere it's of creating, great. like, it's I just so love cool. the look of that opening scene. It's Iconic. got a really early, early 80s, like the Smoky. whole vibe that I just remember being a little kid and, and that moment got me interested in the movie in the first place when the little kid was taking Hoyt Axon to the basement and he's like this is your father's store and it's like down a flight of steps I was just like oh this movie's gonna be good I can feel it I didn't know why this is the vibe you know <laughs> <laughs> well it's amazing set design and production design in that in that shop and uh yeah, it's really setting a great tone for the beginning of this film. So, yeah. Yeah, I love that it immediately introduces the father as just such a tone deaf putz when he tries to sell something to the shop owner. He's like, eh. bathroom buddy, the bathroom, bathroom buddy. buddy. That, that thing is like that. Was that thing's like the size of a toaster? Like, <laughs> I, I love, I love Hoyt Axton's character like as Pelzer because he's just he's so tone deaf. But yet the way he plays the character, you don't so like you, 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 you don't hate the guy like he's not you're not like, oh, I, this this moron that this is me mm -hmm. off. It's like, oh, this lovable. He's yeah, in his goof. world. Yeah. <laughs> but it goes back to the themes of like um, the small town America, like the mm -hmm. little man in their dream of of getting against big business as well, because he, he is just mm -hmm. a small time inventor trying to mm -hmm. make, you know, make his nut in the world. So it's, it's, uh, it's, yeah. it is uh, the little guy versus the big guy kind of mentality. I think there's a, an argument to read this movie as anti-capitalist. Oh, absolutely. I don't know if that was yeah. its intention, but I think you can parse that out if you, if you're looking for it. Yeah. Gremlins well, two takes place in an office building in New York and the capitalism is even worse. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, we are not reviewing that right now. <laughs> I know. I can't help myself. What's oh, funny? God. So, so it's he eventually gets the the gizmo, but it's the grandson that tells him the three rules. But it's mm -hmm. like he says, like, uh, don't first of all, don't get, don't get, don't get. He doesn't like bright light. Don't mm -hmm. suddenly it will kill him. That's the only thing that he actually tells him that will be consequences to this, which mm -hmm. I think is kind of funny. Like, don't get him wet. But he never mm. says what happens, and that mm. kind of drove me nuts because I realized that in the in the real world, and again, this is me, like you know, <laughs> like you know, I realize that this is fans, it's just a movie. But like, if I were Hoyt Axe, I'd be like, well, okay, what happens if it gets wet? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Or what mm. happens if I feed it after midnight? What's do you night? think? You know, do you think I there was know. an element of like, oh, I don't know, it's foreign and or mysterious, audience, or, or audiences know? just? Yeah, there were, I think so. Audiences did, were maybe just a lot more forgiving back in the eighties when it came to these things. Too. Also, yeah, it, it, really, it does take like cinematic license, like they they keep it vague like that for the for the maximum impact of like the yeah thrill machine. But I know what you mean. It's a little thin, but like that's where I mean that it, that it works as as like a as like a fairy tale like a kid's like rhyme novel where it's like don't feed the so-and-so with the, the three steps mm. to the it's got that like childhood like mm. rhyme um vibe to it and so mm. that's what i related to as a little kid watching this movie because yeah. it was like oh don't oh he wasn't supposed to do that and he did that and oh my yeah. god you know but, yeah that's true yeah. it's for kids like it just sets the rules and you're expected to kind of follow the rules which again can be Red is very capitalist. But what pisses me off, if they have rules, <laughs> stick to the rules. Don't get them wet. How wet were these creatures getting in this movie? And it, it didn't matter. They're drinking things. They're walking through snow, which is water. Yeah, I but mean, it's frozen water. Okay, it's, it's fermented. It's... I don't care. They are getting... Okay, those gremlins are guzzling beer, toasting yeah, each other you know they're getting wet really yeah. wet it's a wet movie and yet they... they're not yet yeah, exactly see the that's the thing if you delve even just a fraction of an inch it's like it raises a bunch of questions and like if they don't walk through snow it can't be a christmas movie yeah i know but, but I... don't it could, why couldn't it, they could multiply but why'd it have to be water 
I don't know. Because don't know. <laughs> it, had, it, it had to be water because they could come up with the really excuse for that good scene in the YMCA when he jumps into the pool. I don't know. It could have, which I always love that scene. I see the thing is, I think if they were to remake this movie now, they could do this, but they would have they'd be smarter about these rules. They, mm. they, they figure something out that would make these a little bit more realistic if that's possible. I don't know. I know what you mean. Yeah. There's a lot of things like, first of all, you can't give them water. No living creature can survive without water anyways. I mean, right. it's, they, they could be aliens too. We don't know what these things are. So, but in, it's but 10 they, PM. Do you know where your gremlins are? You know, they, they have water <laughs> inside of them because clearly they're, when you throw one in a microwave, it explodes. It reached a boiling point in five seconds. It had to have water in it. <laughs> Maybe it's a, a certain level of, of surface, le- surface level water contact with the skin, mm. and it has to reach a certain volume for <laughs> the cells go. to absorb. Yeah. And so, yeah, but- you know, a little bit of beer and snow ain't got to do it. Like they need like, they need at least like a fountain, like, you know. Well, it wasn't just a spilled glass, I think, that started the whole... That was, but it was a concentrated spilled glass. That's a good point, though. There wouldn't be that much water if they were in the, you know... In a, but they were never in the rain, though. It was, I never saw a rainy night in that movie. There you go. See, all the water you're talking about, Nathan, has been altered with mm. stuff. It's frozen. It's, like, hoppy and fermented. Okay. There's sure. something there. All I'm saying is sometimes I would also rather have beer than water. You said they can't get wet. That was the rule. That's true. That could be any liquid. It doesn't have to be water. Anyway, I, I, I'm nitpicking. I know there's so much I could nitpick on this. And, you know, I, we could spend 10 hours nitpicking this movie. <laughs> I'm and normally with you on the nitpicky, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyways, so we, we meet Gizmo back at the house where his dad uh, gives Billy a, a 35-year-old man a Christmas present, I feel like. <laughs> Which, how, old, <laughs> how old is Billy supposed to be in this movie? Uh, he's supposed to be like, what is 17? he? He's supposed to be 17. Yeah. He works at the bank. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. It would have been too on the nose Spielberg to have him work at a video store. Well, you know? I, my prediction is, I mean, I don't know if you guys mm. found any information on this. The original script or early script, Billy was probably supposed to be a 12 or 13 year old boy. Mm. It, Interesting. You know, the script, everything Billy says sounds like it's coming out of a 12 year old mouth yeah it well really... he never looked at phoebe cates and said oh gosh so i don't know yeah like every... <laughs> well if you think about like especially like the times where he talks about you know i always thought christmas 7 was supposed to be kind of happy and cheery like wh- you're 22 yeah. years old what world do you live in of course people are miserable they and ate. upset you know like it, he's the most naive 22 year old ever is and he, he brings, 22 in the movie? Is he? I feel like he works at a bank. He, he's, he's, yeah, he, I, I mean, know. I think he's, it was around that age in real he, life. I'm he not looks, sure. He looks yeah. 30. I mean, I think he's 40, but. Interesting. Cause I totally read him as like a teen. <laughs> I read him as like, like 25. Well, uh, and it's funny because the teen and the holdover, I was like, this man is 40. Like, this is a grown man. <laughs> he looks old. Yeah. 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 Um, with Dominic Sessa, is that what you're yeah. talking about? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He looks older. He plays old. Um, but no. Um, so he was he was um, twenty, just almost twenty in in real life. A babe yeah. in the woods. Yeah. To be twenty, <laughs> I don't know. I kind of think maybe that was part of the like the the wholesomeness that gets corrupted, right? The the naivety of the family. But I can totally see it being a younger kid. And the original script. I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah, I don't know that for sure, but it just feels that way. And they just, they recast him, but they never really changed parts of the script. Yeah, I guess <laughs> original, um, original. <laughs> Especially the toy robot Can that falls imagine? out of the stocking. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Remember the toy robot? Like, um, who's that for? <laughs> yeah. Um, That's true. Uh, yeah. So I never original, thought of that. We're just, just going to leave, leave, leave that in there. In, in there. <laughs> it gets so much worse. The original picks, instead of 
uh, Zach were either Judd Nelson or Emilio Estevez, which <laughs> is not. Um, not Emilio any- Estevez would have played it really, really seriously. Like if Emilio Estevez was like combating the final gremlin stripe, <laughs> so like so intense, the camera would push it on him. And he'd be like, so stripe. So <laughs> like Emilio Estevez would like serious, like he would be like, like really gone the force. He would have been doing yeah. force on him. Or something. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Like, yes. So I think like Billy the Kid level, like like maximum <laughs> overdrive, like intense staring. Well, it would be an t- entirely different movie. His energy would be so different. Like, so yeah. Weird. Repo Man came out this year with Emilio Estevez, and that's like that's the energy he would have brought to Gremlins. 100%. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Oh. Absolutely. That was weird. Bad. Yeah. All right. He would have carried um, that. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, Billy takes him upstairs. You know, Gizmo, he just wants to sing. He doesn't need this in his life. He's just, uh, you know, he was doing well on his own and he just. They're so damn mean to Gizmo. Like, they are so mean of like, he's just sitting there like making music and they like, they like hawk a wad of spit at him. And he's like, bro. Oh. <laughs> I always feel so bad for him. Like, poor Gizmo. Corey man. Feldman just being kind yeah. of. <laughs> Oh, he's I, like, I love it how I love yeah. talking about consumerism, like kids that get like bored really easy. I love it how, yes. when yeah. Corey Feldman has that great line where like Zach is like, "Wow, did you see that? It multiplied. Isn't that amazing?" And Corey Feldman's like, "Yeah, that's yeah, it's pretty great." And he like starts reading a magazine. He's like, "No, no, I'm serious. It's it's it's, it's really interesting." He's like, "Doesn't care at all. Doesn't register." Yeah, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so we got like uh, five more. Mogwais that are clearly different uh, demeanor than mm-hmm. than Gizmo. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> really cool special so, effect. They use balloons. Yeah, to make them was, like breathe. That's a really smart idea. That's really cool. Yeah. And Billy takes one to his science teacher at school. Who uh, who's that again? That that actor. Um, I have no idea. That is that's Glenn Turman. Who plays uh, Mr. Hansen at the school? I, I I've seen him in a few things. He's he's really good, and yes, I love that scene. That's yeah, yeah it's pretty. Well, well, yeah. the, the best scene is though when the the mutation happens. And we're jumping ahead here a little bit. Is the scene in the in that classroom after they're watching that uh like that old school like six uh, like eight millimeter film of like uh, mm-hmm. animal heartbeats and stuff like that mm-hmm. and the bell rings and then it's just him he doesn't turn the lights on he's just like there chasing the, this gremlin around it's i mean it's kind of ridiculous yeah, yeah but i do going... think it is kind of the closest that the film skirts to horror yes you know? absolutely that's what i mean the movie turn at the 50 minute mark this movie goes full-blown horror which is really cool. We we it, it transitions to that in this movie. In this scene here, is one of the best in the in the in the whole film. Um, but what an idiot! I mean, he he takes what's, what's he feeding him underneath this desk? He this is a, a science teacher. He knows that this a thing. He's talking science. about how how the creature this thing has uh, metamorphosized mm-hmm. and, and it's coming out something else he knows it's a different type of creature he doesn't know what it is yet he is just gonna have faith with some Do some blood of candy work. i'm just gonna feed this thing i don't know what it is under the desk also drove me nuts like no person in the right mind would yeah. do that not even knowing what it looks like there's like there's like a i know what you're saying there's like a way to to like have his character die but in a more intelligent manner where he doesn't like mm. betray his science although i that's another example we, of them we don't know that he's dead actually i mean we assume he is that True, dude's he dead yeah. Well, yeah we know we, we we believe that but he's got a needle in his in his butt you know but yeah he got butt needled i don't yeah. think gremlins like is tricking us on anything. No. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, we never see any human deaths like on screen. Yeah. But I'm assuming that they die. I mean, I mean, we sort of see Mrs. Deagle fly out the window, but <laughs> Yeah. We are I mean, well that's, actually that's death, on, yeah. the, on the radio, it's the only confirmed death if you because you know I listen I watch this movie with the subtitles on because I, I do that a lot these days. And if you listen him. to uh, Rock and Ricky uh, Rialto, he right. confirms on the radio that Mrs. Deagle did die. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah cause I never picked that up before. <laughs> that is, uh, I just, that scene, uh, yeah, yeah. It's hilarious. It's <laughs> they actually hilarious. dropped a house on her. 
<laughs> well, she is the embodiment of the Wicked Witch uh, from Wizard of Oz. Yeah. 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 The way the whole threat to the dog Barney mm-hmm. is Toto is an absolute like reference to Wicked uh, Wizard of Oz. Yeah. On a brief like style so comment, evil. I love how like I love how visually dense Gremlins is. Like, there's a lot of like mm-hmm. gags and information compacted into a lot of shots. So, like an iconic example being the bar scene, where it's like every single puppet is active. There's stuff all over the yeah. place. Like it's like visually dense for me. I even that I love the shot when it's like you know pans down from the Spielberg movie theater where you see like you know the alternate titles for his films. Then then it follows like Zach to work. Then it passes a Burger King and it's like small town, friendly people, Burger King advertising the movie theater. Oh, Mrs. Deagle's horrible. You make such a good point. Cause I think in like the absence of real deep character building, you're able to get this really fleshed out world. Yes, definitely. Like they do a good job with the atmosphere of the, of the movie. They just like set the tone and like, I love the the holiday kind of creepy Christmas vibe. Like it's just, Mm. It's, it's claustrophobic, but yeah. it's also kind of cozy sometimes. And Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So w- we got to talk about the scene um, where the the gremlins hatch and the mom finds them. By the way, I, I, I want to back up for one second because I, I noticed something regarding the, the mom that I never picked up before. Earlier in the movie, she's watching the end of It's a Wonderful Life. Mm-hmm. And it's yes. the, and it's the scene where George is running through the streets, you know, shouting "Merry Christmas, Movie House, Merry Christmas, um, Emporium." Mm. I never noticed this before, but ironically, in the movie Gremlins, the last two major set pieces that take place, you know, in uh, in chronological chronological order are the movie theater and then finally the department store, also known as an Emporium. And that's, I never picked yeah. that up until this that's viewing cool. of it. That that's the last two set pieces of this movie, and that's what happens in in uh, It's a Wonderful Life, cool. where he's shouting that. So also that shout was- out mom for great taste. Yes, that's a good movie. So that's awesome. Um, yeah, yeah. I thought that was just a really cool thing. I never. I mean, I've seen this. Like I said, I've seen this movie probably over twenty times. I never picked that up. There's a lot of uh, things going on on TV screens that mm-hmm. it's uh, it's. Um, making references to in the movie all the time. So anyways, also, yeah, it's like a treasure and especially trove, yeah. can we say in, in terms of referential, and I know I've thrown a lot out tonight, but I think it's just littered with them. So it's easy to do Looney Tunes. It's felt yes. real mm-hmm. Bugs Bunny vibes. To That's me. what I love. Yeah. It's, like, it's like a wacky Warner Brothers cartoon nightmare mm. movie. That's what I Especially love. when we get to the Emporium. Yes. Um, but we got to talk about the mom and she sees those eggs uh, it looks like a scene from the movie Alien, actually. Mm-hmm. Those, those those eggs. Wet. One Literally. of the. Do you guys agree that's one of the greatest needle drops of movie history? When the record player starts seeing, uh, do you hear what I hear? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That was so good. <laughs> that's still one of the greatest moments. And that's my mom's favorite Christmas song, and now I associate it with this. Yeah. And um, you guys want to talk about that that kitchen scene? I mean, that's iconic that scene is incredible because it just like takes the movie to like it's still i mean we've seen the horror by this point but like a lot of the movie has been like cute and family and gizmo and this scene where she basically full-on defends herself and like successfully attacks the gremlins is so hardcore (laughs) and what i like about it is that it's not it's it's one of the scenes in the movie that's not played for laughs i mean there's humor in it mm-hmm. but it's creepier like the gremlin getting microwaved and like her mm-hmm. like stabbing the other one like she's she's basically it's dark. like it's dark she's like fighting for her life and i love it when she goes to the door and she thinks she heard something and you see like the shadow of a gremlin like along the wall disappear like that always creeped me out as a kid because i was like oh my god that's one of them they've hatched um but that whole kitchen scene yeah i just i just love the I love the tone of it. I like, I just like how it's more serious and horror and like creepy in nature and also like disgustingly entertaining in so gremlins fashion. What do you want? No, I please. love like, here's the thing. You explode something in a microwave. I love your movie. That is super fun for me. Also, it sets the mom up as the, like the straight man, the serious one. Like you can see that she's probably the one who's keeping the household running. Cause it's exactly. really not like that. <laughs> you know? Exactly. It's like a, just a great commentary on like those dynamics in the eighties as well. Now, 
I'm going to play devil's advocate here for a moment. So the mom comes in, put yourself in the, the gremlins position for a moment. What were they doing wrong to... Uh, they suck. They're wet no, and weird. No, but they're just in the kitchen. You know, they, they saw yum yums. And <laughs> the woman comes in and just, first of all, you know, throws one into the mixer. And then <laughs> what did they do to her? You know, <laughs> first of all, they had, they, she, she drew first blood. She drew wow. first blood. Wow. You know? Okay. Gremlin sympathizer <laughs> on this podcast. I'm really kidding. This I don't know. I just, I just thought it was kind of funny. She came in with guns a blazing. She came in hot. She, she, she didn't, she, she did. like, she saw these things and like, I'm just taking them out. But like, I think that's so like Western, yeah, cool. like there's a good guy and a bad guy and you yeah. don't need to know why he's just bad and like rock and roll. Yeah, like like the 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 irritant. I'm begging like the, you yeah. not to think about it too much. <laughs> I'm overthinking all of this. I'm overthinking so, all of this because what else have I got to do? You are, you are. <laughs> I got to fuck with this, you know. <laughs> oh my god! I, I just um, like the build up, like right before they hatch, and like Gizmo's having mm, trouble sleeping, and like you, you feel like yeah, the do like you feel a sense of dread coming. So I feel like that mom scene where she fights them is a really satisfying payoff to that buildup of suspense. Cause you're like, Oh my God, they're here. And this is like serious now. And she's got to survive. And like when she, you know, I love when she knocks the stocking and there's the robot present for like 21 year old Zach. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, she's 45. I, you know, when, when, <laughs> when she is like, where's the, you don't know where the gremlin is. And you see its eyes light up in the Christmas tree behind her. And like, oh that was good. I know that jump scare so well now that I, it's like mechanical for me at this point. Cause I've watched it to death, but that always used to get me when it was in the tree like that. I love that shot. You're so right. That's good. Classic, yeah. Classic. So Stripe is the only one that survives. He gets away and goes to the uh, the Y, the YMCA, and eventually jumps into the pool where uh, he makes hundreds, thousands of gremlins, uh, undetermined amount of, uh, <laughs> of gremlins. We don't know how many. A, f- a flock of gremlins. <laughs> a gaggle. Some, a gaggle. Someone say a murder. A murder of gremlins. A murder of gremlins by <laughs> Joe Dante. <laughs> I was going with a gaggle of gremlins, but whatever. I like, I like that. A gaggle of gremlins because that's like a <laughs> gaggle of gremlins. <laughs> and I think is that when like the real chaos in Kingston Falls takes place where we mm-hmm. get shenanigans where they yep. just start messing with everything and pretending that they're Christmas carolers and, mm-hmm. and going after the Futtermans and, and they take out uh, Mrs. Deagle. I think that's, this is the order of things. Which when is- they go after the Futtermans, like in that, when they take the um, vehicle and like, um, and drive through the Futterman's house. I love it when it like cuts to like Dick Miller. He's like, Oh my God, there's a gremlin in my house. Ah! <laughs> like, because all his paranoid fears right. of, like, oh, it have is been confirmed letter. real. And he's like, Oh my God, it's a real gremlin. It's a real gremlin. <laughs> that scene yeah. amuses the hell out of me. And I actually, I, I've always felt a little bit bad for his wife earlier in that scene where she's like, tis the season she's singing she's like right murray and he's just like nah, i'm watching tv damn foreign tv like he's just like in his miserable world and she's trying to like be festive and he's not should've, responding to it about yeah. a zenith right should have bought a zenith yeah <laughs> forgot about uh, zenith yeah there's a great nod to to futterman's like paranoia there when in the in the tavern scene which we'll talk about um one of the gremlins goes to shoot phoebe cates and misses and hits like a World War II bomber, like an RAF, and just a yes. nod to the gremlins. Yeah. It's like, that's so good. Yeah. It's a good bit. Like, exactly. There's like, the movie is chock full of bits everywhere. Yeah. And like, uh, sometimes good. multiple times at once in the same shot. That's why I like it. Yeah. And like, um, I, I promise I will shut up about it. I'll say really quick that Gremlins <laughs> 2 pushes that concept further. But that's all I'm saying. <laughs> Gremlins oh. 2, where Zach is 63. Yeah. <laughs> Gremlins 2 is a New York City, like, cynical, like, you'll, Nathan, you will especially, I think you will like it. You will be reviewing it uh, in late 2024. Okay. Or 2025, I don't know. Is, is it a Christmas movie? Uh, no, it's a New York it now. summer movie. Okay. <laughs> 
Well, let's 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 talk about Dory's Tavern because that's kind of yes. a, a big scene. One of my favorites. Well, I I'll be I'll say it. I kind of used to like that, but this this the thing that I did not like about the Gremlins is when they start to mimic like American culture and dressing up. Cause I like the Gremlins when they are chaotic and mm. causing the mischief. But when they start like mimicking flash dance, it's <laughs> like, what the <laughs> hell is going yeah. on? Yeah. And, and it's like, it's, it's a little much for me. Um, but you know what? I, I don't hate it. I don't hate this scene, but it goes on and on and on. It's long. And That's why? when I start to get real, like I get it vibes, but I do like it because I think it, it's, it's like so the creative. only time we get to see Phoebe Cates's character do anything. Yeah, but it, which but, but it is it is magic, this scene. It really is. Yeah. Like, what, what the it is it's really a fit like it feels it feels fun. like and is it's definitely a set piece in the movie. You know what I mean? Like the bar scene. Like, yeah. Yeah. What's it's going on in this? It, it, I can't. I can't deny it. it is a ton of fun, but there's some just things that are just ridiculous. That, that yeah. was just one. Why are they taking the time to learn how to play poker when their main objective is just <laughs> chaos? Because they're just they're just wacky little guys. Are they're they just wacky? wacky little guys, Nathan. Uh, and so they anyways. Do. And they had they had some sense of culture. I mean, they like Snow White. They like the movie. They actually enjoy. Okay, the movie. can we talk about the movie theater? Because that whoa, 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 is whoa. my favorite scene. No, we'll get there in a moment. Why no. is Phoebe Cates serving them drinks? Probably because they all rushed into the bar, guys. and they like gave her no choice. And if she tries to run away, they'll like maul yeah. her or something. You know? What Have I mean? you like, considered that she's working really hard for tips? Actually, are they, are they tipping and her? <laughs> maybe. What are they tipping her with? What do they have? What? what? Hard money, maybe they seem like thieves. They, were, I could see them stealing for sure. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I, I just, I that whole aspect of the scene just, Listen, just did not. Phoebe make Cage just me. has hospitality embedded in her bones. I think that it's probably the fact that you know when you're working at a bar, you are just it's ingrained in you that you have to no matter what you have to serve the the customers that's the I thing and they just like that. ran in and like started ordering drinks like, like they just yeah. like well i got to she's like i'm stuck yeah i'm stuck yeah. here yeah, Why even not? if she wanted to leave they wouldn't they you know she, she, she they wouldn't take Nathan, Kylie you to can't that. have it both ways the mom shoots first that's bad phoebe tries to be kind peace treaty olive that's branch there's the no problem. consistency to any of the rules to this that's the thing that's what I'm talking about. The character motivations. I it's just it's like it's 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 crazy. I see. I know what you mean. Like I I know what you mean in theory, and I like totally like appreciate it and get it. I think for me the the satire of the gremlins mimicking humans and just being like drunk like a hole versions of humans that are like raunchy and raucous. I just I totally buy into that. Like so that comedy stuff as long as it's like funny. That it totally works for me, and I get that about the rule breaking, but I don't. The movie's set of rules is so thin that to, for me, Gremlins is more a, a, a theme about like anarchy, and so like all that stuff and the crazy antics and like them doing the like you know dancing video and stuff in the mm -hmm. bar. It's just like part of the part, part of, of the part of the mayhem. Yeah, it's like a wild party from hell or something. I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> well, I don't know. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> well, after this, they do escape. Uh, uh, Billy comes and rescues her, and they escape to. They go to work. <laughs> they go to. They go to the bank to, to hide out for a little bit, and this is where Kate. Sorry. So uh, yeah, her name is Kate, right? Mm -hmm. um, she shares uh, the story about what happened to her dad. Um, now, again. I, I I don't I I do like this movie. This is I, I love nuts. this movie, but this, this is yes, nuts. This story is I remember at the time messed up. I like I let you guys talk in a second. Here. I I remember when I watched this growing up. I'm like this is awful. <laughs> like this is a terrible thing. I cracked up listening why, listening to this this time. This is the this is the most bizarre. It's not that it's uh, not a heartbreaking story, but the way that this comes up during this chaos where she just this comes this comes out of not out of like um what i would say a moment of vulnerability 
but it's coming out of this moment where out of frustration that she said, now this is another reason why I hate Christmas. And it's just such a bizarre moment for her to share this story. It's, it's not about the story and what, it, 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 what happened. It's just the timing of this makes no mm-hmm. sense to me, I feel like now. It's, it's, a, it's a random like payoff from when earlier in the movie when she's like, I don't – I'm not cheery at Christmas and Billy is like, I thought people at Christmas were happy. Like why aren't you happy? Then she's like later on, she's like, I'll tell you why because my father like tried to be Santa Claus, jumped into a chimney and like died, which is just nuts. But like um, – and they I, smelled funny. him. I'm. I don't. I. I. I always thought the scene was like a, a weird, quirky character thing about here. So I found it interesting. But I will say that uh, Spielberg apparently did not want that story in the movie, and mm-hmm. he had recommended Joe Dante to cut it. But Joe Dante held firm and wanted to keep that scene. And so Spielberg said, "You know, no worries. Like you're the director; it's your movie." But like that was the one scene that I th- of note Spielberg was not a huge fan of that. Um, so I read. I don't know. It's, it's dark as hell. And it also probably ruined the magic of Santa Claus for some young kids too, that were watching this movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a little strange. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also uh, acknowledged and made fun of in gremlins too, but, uh, uh, but um, uh, <laughs> I agree. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it's a real bizarre uh, character moment. Like I said, I think the timing of it is is the real crime of this. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the, it's the thing. I know what you mean. It, it does exist there randomly. Like even though it sort of works on me, it does feel like random character moment, quiet scene before. Like we need it. Just it's it's, it's only purpose. It's like it's a lull before mm-hmm. the next like action. It's like well, okay, the theater blew up. The whole thing. Or no, it didn't. That didn't happen yet. But like, the tavern they, did, yeah. Yeah, they just stop for a moment. It's like they take a break from the movie. She's mm. like, "Here's a story." Okay, let's go back to set, and then they like continue with Gremlins. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's just I do think like you that, need yeah. the lull, but that wasn't how. That wasn't. Yeah, I'm, they not like just, that. Not like, like that. Hung out and talked. Yeah, <laughs> no. yeah. Um, it did prove that there are two monsters in this movie: Gremlins and the Grinch. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> mm. But you know, after they leave, there actually is a really cool moment. I love the when they leave the bank and they go out and everything is quiet and peaceful. Yes. And all of downtown is uh is empty. And it's a really nice moment where I think that is the moment where the movie breathes for a second mm-hmm. for a few moments. It's a beautiful scene of the of downtown of the downtown area. Um, and that's where they find eventually that the gremlins are have all gone into the movie theater. Hi ho. Yeah. And they, Billy and glorious bastards, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think that Quentin Tarantino got the idea from this movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I do remember <laughs> seeing this film uh, like on VHS later on when I was like 10 or nine and I was watching it with friends and his mom and she hadn't seen the movie before and like the second he decides to like m- you know set fire to the theater sh- when he's like you know pl- like turning the gas fuse or whatever she's watching it and is like they're gonna blow up the theater that's so irresponsible there's other ways to handle this like you're gonna blow <laughs> yes. up the theater <laughs> So good. It is kind of, it is kind of ridiculous. Like it does not ensure they're going to kill all the gremlins. There's sure. probably there's probably so many exits out of that place. Okay, they <laughs> that scene rips. It's super fun. It, I it love that cool. it's Snow White of all the things. That scene yeah, and I love that yeah. they like actually enjoy it. Like that's what's hilarious. Yes, like, yeah. I was, yeah, I was watching this. I'm like, man, Steven Spielberg cannot let a movie go by without telling us how much he loves movies. Like this yeah. guy yeah. loves the movies. Yeah, I do think it's funny that of all the Disney movies they chose, they chose the one with like dwarves and also like picking diamonds it was like the mining scene mm, so yeah. there is a little something there i think but it was just i love watching them all like doing their little dance because gizmo <laughs> likes to sing and these guys like to move it on and gizmo picked up the ho high the hi-ho song too when yeah. he was leaving too which was really great it was a good time yeah. good time at the movies until it wasn't but yeah. it's a good time for me <laughs> and um yes. And Stripe um, goes out to the lobby before this happens and they're out of popcorn, but he sees across the street 
uh, at the uh, department store with the big signs as candy. So he goes to get more yum yums. Who uh, wouldn't? So uh, yeah, I hear you. Yeah. So he escapes the the big burning uh, theater, and there's a showdown at the uh, department store. Mm-hmm. Which I think they used one corner of the department store. They kept re- redecorating it for, for each scene, if you notice closely. I am not. I did not notice that. That yeah, was good movie it, magic on me. Uh, but the, also, the, by the end of the movie, I was like, okay, this is the end of the movie. Like all the, rain, the TVs and then the sporting department, sporting goods department. It's, it's the same corner that Billy keeps mm-hmm. walking around. Um, but it's okay. It's okay. It kind of <laughs> reminded me of our Bad Santa episode. Like, because there's Ooh, a department store yeah. shooting that too and i was like man this is just christmas christmas back when malls were a thing it wasn't it wasn't even like a mall i mean this is all downtown that's what it made me really nostalgic for you know i i used to live in some towns that had like the the big town green and Mm. not a single chain store anywhere and that's what i remember besides there was a burger king they showed that Mm. in the beginning but everything else was a mom and pop store and even the department store, that was not a Sears or mm-hmm. anything like that. That was just a mom and pop department store. Probably not even like a big one, you know, probably no more than maybe. Yeah, like but gone seven, are the days of even department 9, stores. Square feet. Yeah, exactly. You know? you know, that was, you know, so it was, uh, it was really cool, you know, having mm-hmm. seen that. Yeah, I just, exa- yeah. I liked, I loved just the production design and feel of the department mm-hmm. store and that scene the eerie with the lights off and like stripe appearing on the television mm-hmm. screen like i just that that whole department store scene and the showdown and like the pacing of that scene like structurally i love that because it's just like mm-hmm. classic the hero versus the villain and like gizmo comes in and saves the day like i just i like i just like that um being in the climax setting for the for the movie and having it a one off like it just feels mm-hmm. like an added bonus after the big like set piece of the theater blowing up and all that yeah. that you get a satisfying like one on one you a know duel. fight like oh, yeah. a, a duel yeah and like yeah. the chain not the chainsaw the blade and stuff like I just a I just real ha- real chainsaw, chainsaw. yeah oh, a it real was. chainsaw oh, it was. yeah wow yeah that's right I forgot about that yeah designed for gremlin size per thing <laughs> <laughs> but real chainsaw yeah. Real chainsaw. Crazy. Um, and I was glad that it was like in a medium, like it would have been different if it was in like a giant empty, like I liked that it was Mm. in a smaller store like that. Thank God Mm. it wasn't a Walmart. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Super center. (laughs) So we have the, then it ends, you know, the big showdown. Uh, Stripe finds uh, the water fountain and Mm -hmm. what amazing, um, Again, the the special effects where he's climbing up the water fountain and, and those th- bubbles are coming off of his back and he's about to like so cool. spurt out more of those uh, more of those creatures and that whole thing where where um, the the sunlight is uh, where Gizmo raises up the shade and Stripe falls in the water he jumps out and he is just melting away. That is some of the best really practical cool. effects that I've seen uh, from the eighties. That's I'm really a God, staunch. So yeah. yeah, I'm a staunch practical effects person, and I I love when it's blended really well with CGI. And I think they they did a good job in this movie of that. Um, I think I'm I went to go see the new Hunger Games recently, and it was just so it was just so artificial, and I'm just so mm. exhausted by looking at things that are so flat um, and feel so so two dimensional and lifeless and I think obviously CGI has its place and so we're going to use it for a long, long time, but it just felt so nice to have something that felt really tactile and had a lot of texture on the screen. I'm just like, man, bring, bring that back. Yeah. It's, it's such a real, like it just made the creature seem like a real, like biological, like creepy yeah. organism. I just remember being as a little kid being really, really satisfied with that yeah. climax and impressed by like stripes, like death scene I just felt like the, the the movie pays off well there and like gives you the classic, like what you want. And so when it got to the end of the movie, I just felt like kind of yeah. like emotionally satisfied. Yeah. Like, yeah. And I was entertained and wow, crazy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, by the way, I want to give a shout out to uh, mushroom, the dog. He did some good dog acting in this movie. Some of the best. Oh, yeah. I've had. Yes. A lot of movies yeah. I've seen. Yeah. So yeah. 
<laughs> he has like a little faux hawk going on. Yeah. With his fur. Super cute. Because he goes up to that that pu- that puddle of slime at the end of that. I'm like, don't put your nose in that. Something bad's gonna happen. I yeah. I always <laughs> I always see that scene. I'm like, I always think he's gonna put his paw in that or something. And he, he doesn't, but like, ugh. Yeah. He does a good, he's a good he boy. A good boy. That's right. Take the sequel in a different direction. A gremlin dog. Right? <laughs> a grog. A grog. So, <laughs> all right, we've gone through this movie, and oh, we the final scene. Of course, we can't forget that is when they go back to the house, and Mister Wing comes back to take Gizmo back home. And mm-hmm. uh, any thoughts? Do you on think this? there are other Gizmos in the shop, and and our Gizmo is like, you guys are never going to believe what happens. <laughs> I just, one thing I do, I feel is like a little bit emotionally over the top. Like it's t- supposed to tug at the heartstrings, but it makes me laugh. I still love it. Like I'm amused by it, but it like, it just, when Gizmo turns at the last minute before he's going back into the box and he's like, bye Billy. Yes. And, and you're like, you're like, Oh, <laughs> but oh it God. just, it, it's not bad. It's good. But it's just funny because I just like know what they're going for there, and they to me it's like a little bit overdone. A yeah. little ET phone home. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. it's 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 good, but nothing compares to like ET saying like I'll be right here or something like that. Oh, I mean that was so that's just like that's like up on the mountaintop, and this is more just like cutesy Adios. merchandise. Hey, yeah. Billy, you know. I just still, I, I still love it. Like that's I'm just being like lightly critical, you know. I am always like. Did Mr. Wing, how far did Mr. Wing walk? Like, that looks like a trek. <laughs> and was Gizmo he's singing to, he's hi He's going ho. to the bus station, B. That's all yeah, he's doing. He's yeah, walking yeah. to the bus station. I do love that last mat shot, though, of him, like, it's walking beautiful. out into the night. That's, like, such a mystical, snowy, like. Beautiful. And when he walks out, in the, and, and I already was talking about the, the family just standing there in the, in the doorway. It's like they're, like, postcard ready in that scene. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Gremlins, good movie. Yeah. It works. I love it. Just the tone. It's yeah. It's uh, yeah. En- enjoyable for sure. All right. So I think uh, well, this was a really fun discussion on the film. So, but let's. Uh, I think we can close the book mm-hmm. on Gremlins. And uh, mm-hmm. but I think uh, before we do, let me let me uh, do uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. So th- as we said before, this is our last episode of. 2023. I can't believe we are here. Crazy. Um, but I think like 40, 41 episodes. I can't keep track. It's it's a lot. It's been a busy year. But I just want to thank you know everyone that has been following us, listening to our show, sharing, giving us ratings and reviews on any of the uh, the podcast platforms this year. We really appreciate it. Uh, we also would love to get your feedback on our discussion of Gremlins. It would mean a lot to us if you would. Uh, Send us an email or contact us on any of our social media outlets. You can email us at backtotheframerate at gmail.com. You can also find us on those social media platforms. Our handle is backtotheframerate. Uh, your support is greatly appreciated, so please just take a moment. And uh, it would be great if you left a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever your preferred. And it would be great if it was five stars. Podcast, yes. Any podcast app you use would be appreciated. So, uh, yeah. So let's get to our recommendation shelf. Mm-hmm. Sir. What? Are either one of these any good? I don't watch movies. Well, have you heard anything about either one of them? I find it's best to stay out of other people's affairs. You mean you haven't heard anybody say anything about either one of these? Nope. Well, what about these two? Oh, well, they suck. <laughs> so our our recommendation shelf theme this week as a tie-in to Gremlins is consumerism in film. Mm-hmm. So we are going to recommend some films. Here we go. Um, <laughs> yeah. B, would you like to begin? Sure. <laughs> I think anytime there's consumerism, or a lot of times when there's consumerism in a movie, it's anti Right. Yes. Um, that was sort of what was bubbling up for me. I think, you know, of course, Marvel and Hasbro and Toy Story, you get, you get stuff. 
but um, I went staunchly anti-consumerist for this one, and I went with Sorry to Bother You, mm -hmm. uh, the 2018 Boots Riley film, which is just awesome. It's so visually inventive. It's stunning. It keeps you on your toes the whole time, and it has this very overt theme of anti-capitalism, anti-consumerism. Uh, the essential points of the plot are that a low-level telemarketer cashes or cash green um fi finds this magical key to succeeding at work which is this insane jedi level code switching that he does um and is able to progress through the ranks until he encounters the cocaine snorting freewheeling ceo who offers him positions beyond his wildest dreams and how that rampant consumerism affects his life and his relationships and is maybe not as great as he thought it would be um it is packaged in just one of the coolest movies. Lakeith Stanfield is insane in this film. He's just crushing it. Tessa Thompson also doing amazing work in this movie. Um, Terry Crews is in it. He's really great. But it's just, it's so unpredictable. Every time something happened in this film, I was like, what? That's what happens next? It just, it kept me on my toes the whole time. I absolutely loved it. Um, so folks should watch that if you're able it's on prime it's on 2b it's on video on demand go check it out yeah i i recommend Quality it as film. well it's it's definitely a, definitely has an absurdist quality to it as well yes. I, it's a movie that i almost recommended when we were doing uh we, we were doing absurdist films and we were doing Bo is afraid that week and i said this yeah. is something to it's very it, surreal it was almost yeah. there almost there but yeah that was a great pick i'm glad somebody finally brought it up um, and I will say, if you want to buy something, there's an artist on Etsy who makes the earrings from that film. Oh, so you should go find that. Very cool. All right. Uh, Sam, what have you got for us this week? So I'm going to go with another Joe Dante film, actually. It came out in 1998. It's called Small Soldiers. Um, and in many oh, ways, really? it's um, very similar to Gremlins. Uh, Gremlins is a much more successful genre picture and that it kind of hits all the marks like really well small soldiers is a bit more uneven but i highly highly enjoy it i find it entertaining in a nutshell mm -hmm. it's a film about a kid who his his father uh like gremlins works at a toy store and is an unsuccessful event and uh, unsuccessful inventor and the kid gets a hold of a new toy that this corrupt corporate company has put out and in a nutshell it's run by dennis leary <laughs> and in order to um, in order to like sell these like military um, doll toys to kids, they actually amp them up and put military level sophisticated chips into the toys, making the toys totally destructible, like organized, highly intelligent. They want to shoot things. So it's the gremlin theme of like a toy or like a cuddly one out of control. But it's it's different. Um I find the movie really amusing. Uh, Kirsten Dunst is in it. Gregory Smith, Tommy Lee Jones is the voice of one of the soldiers. And this is one of Phil Hartman's last film, if not the last yeah. film he shot before his murder, unfortunately. And so he's hilarious in this. I think this movie uh, takes the cynical tone of Gremlins and pushes it uh, to an unbelievable level without giving anything away. I'll simply say that there's a really good moral character in the film who's like, I can't believe what this horrible company has done to us. No amount of money can change this. And like Dennis Leary just walks into the shot, writes him a check, and he's like, oh, never mind. You guys are great. <laughs> and I'm like, ah, I Joe Dante, it. yes. <laughs> this is such a good movie. You, I, I didn't, so you've seen it. Yeah. I missed it. Yeah. I love it. Isn't it great? It's a wacky so, movie. Yeah. This is the Joe Dante movie that I grew up on. Yes, I love this movie. And see, yeah. I did what's what's interesting to me is I did not grow up on it. See, I grew up on Gremlins. Mm -hmm. I saw this movie much later, yeah. like on TV. Um at, literally no joke. I was like in India and like we were like watching this in a hotel room and I'm like, this movie is great. How did I miss this? Like oh, I love it. It it's okay. just it's just uh it's crazy too. It's like anarchy tone like gremlins it's just got that cynical joe dante vibe that i love joe dante um, really has the energy though of like his mom left his dad for an inventor you know <laughs> and he's like mad about it yes exactly yeah <laughs> it's like it's a charged atmosphere there there's an undercurrent in his films 100 but this yeah this movie's good 
Yeah, definite okay. recommend. I mean, obvious consumerism, like there's, you know, evil, greedy corporations selling like products, but like enjoy the hell out of it. Not a huge success in summer 98 because there were big movies like Armageddon and stuff like that, but did well. And I think it was like uh, more of like a cult hit on, you know, video and stuff afterward, but I freaking love it. So that would I'm be driving opinion. across the lawn. That'll be yes. with me forever. <laughs> yes. It's awesome. Yeah. I, love uh, it. I, I need to check it out. I've, I, I have to check it out in, I haven't seen it in 23 years or so. It's been a long time, but yeah. It just has a cool Ooh. tone to it yeah. that I like. Yeah. I watched it on a TV that had a VHS player as part of the TV. Oh, nice. <laughs> yes. Yeah, nice. I love those details. So that's a really like sure. good, good memory. Like that gave me a, a an atmosphere of that memory, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. And I was checking. This is uh, it's, it's streaming now on on Max and Paramount Plus, and it's on VOD. I have no uh, excuse. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, just to back up, I don't know if you mentioned B, but uh, sorry mm-hmm. to bother you. It's also on Prime Video, Tubi, and VOD. Mm-hmm. Just all right. So my pick, if I can cue it up here. So my pick uh, for this week uh, for consumerism in film, or I guess anti-consumerism, is really what what we're doing. Um, I think this is truly a cinematic achievement. <laughs> uh, this is directed by the legendary Larry Cohen. If you don't know the name Larry Cohen, then I'm sorry. He's one <laughs> of the old guard who worked in TV going back into the 50s. He would go on to write for shows like The Fugitive and The Defenders. Mm. Uh, it wasn't until the 70s that he made a name for himself in the horror and black exploitation genre. Mm-hmm. Um, I highly recommend checking out some of his early work on films like Black Caesar, It's Alive, uh, It Lives Again is another mm. one. Uh, he also directed one of my favorite 80s creature features. The movie is called Q, just the letter Q, and it's mm. starring David Carradine. I really love that film. But the movie that ties in so beautifully into our theme this week is the 1985 film, The Stuff. And it stars, I have not seen this. It stars Michael uh, Moriarty uh, uh, and uh, Paul Sorvino, Andrea Mor- I, I'm going to mess up his name. An- uh, Andrea Markovici, I think is how you say it. Uh, it's got mm-hmm. Garrett Morris, who plays Chocolate, Chocolate Chip Charlie in it. Uh, <laughs> great character, actor, and comedian. Um, oh, nice. So this film- Look at the poster, awesome. <laughs> yeah, this film serves as this scathing critique of consumer culture and how people blindly just follow trends and consume products without questioning its origins or potential dangers. Um, basically, without giving too much of the plot away, a mysterious white substance is discovered on Earth, and due to corporate greed, it gets immediately packaged up and sold to people for profit because people just can't get enough of the stuff. <laughs> oh, <laughs> is, I love this. It's is some of a horror film. So yeah, some there's some horrible things that just happen. It just gets nasty in this movie. It's branded like a horror film. Yeah. The film, yeah. it, it's just a biting satire that is poking fun at the advertising industry and how it manipulates public opinion and mm. to its very gullible consumer base. It's one of the, the best movies, uh, you know, honestly about unchecked capitalism. So mm. I, you know, it is, it's a B movie for sure, but oh. it is saying so much. So I might watch I, this tonight. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's on AMC Plus. It's on Tubi. It's on Pluto, Shutter, and you can rent it on VOD. Yeah. Oh yeah, and that's my watch list. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a lot of fun. And I really I, like it's alive. Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, my pick this week. And uh, yeah, so uh, uh, let us know if you uh, watch any of our recommendations, and let us know what you think. Mm-hmm. So there you have it. So, and uh, any other closing thoughts on the end of the year? Bye, Billy. (laughs) 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 So good. Well, this has been fun, 2023. You know, next week we are going to do something a little different. Um, The show that comes out on New Year's Day is going to be uh, not a movie review, but we're going to be doing uh, a 1984 movie draft, which I think is going to be a lot of fun. 
Ellie's still going to be on vacation, but we're going to do a, like I said, 84 movie draft. So tune in for that. And it's going to be a lot of fun because it's the 40 year anniversary of all these movies that we're going to be drafting and uh, tune in for that. And you'll learn about what that's going to be. So, and then awesome. we're going to take, then we're going to take a week off and come back a couple weeks after that with come back stronger. Come back, exactly with uh, some uh, all new content, new movies that we're watching and uh, can't wait for uh, what's going to come in 2024. So stick with us. Yeah. The adventure continues. Yeah. All right. So that concludes the show for this week. We appreciate your listenership. And as a final reminder, if you're enjoying what you hear, please consider leaving a rating and review. Your support truly brightens our day. The ideal platforms for this are Apple Podcasts or iTunes or whichever platform you use to access our content. Uh, to stay updated, I didn't mention this before, but don't forget to subscribe to our monthly newsletter, Frame Rate Monthly. Uh, you can do that by sending an email to back to the frame rate at gmail.com. Back to the frame rate is a proud member of the Western Media Podcast Network. So stay connected with us on Facebook and Instagram. Our handle again is back to the frame rate. And of course, the most effective way to support us is by sharing our episodes. Please share our episodes on your social media platforms. Support means the world to us. 2023, what a long, strange trip it's been. And I got to say, it all comes down to the greatest movie of the year, 65 with Adam Driver. <laughs> That's why I became a podcaster. That's just, just, it doesn't get any better than that. Mm-hmm. Nothing else came out this year. That's uh, our, our, our message for you all. <laughs> 65 that was it it was great so ended long there. thanks Just for all the fish it's possible, it's possible that the world ended at that episode and this has all been a dream after that who knows it, it's possible it's yeah. possible all right. all right the show is over goodbye I want you to know it's over.